just yeah. merged with anything. It lives entirely on its own, it is autonomous. It will obviously affect uh, people's behaviour in different ways in relation to the other things that happen to us in social policy. But the system of income is an entirely autonomous issue, and that's one of its virtues. It's not affected by anything else. Martin, have you done the sums? kinds of ways of organizing a level at which statistics are to be paid. This does not say how much it will be. Um, and um, there's no space to be had about how much it should be for each particular age group. Um, and you have simply a, a single example in the booklet. The example in the booklet is very useful, that is no additional public expenditure will be required. Um, and the and the two people who put together the figures are Philip Ginsburg there and Mark Bosworth who sitting behind you. So if you want to talk about the figures, then I'm going to see the, the, um, the authors of them, um, then please do just talk to them about the next one. I don't know if I for the question, but uh, it, it's to do with the, the pound a year question. And I think you mentioned before that one of the interesting things to do with maybe feasibility later on is even at a very small level, it can start to generate benefits and it allows you to see how it's working before you go for the seventy-one pounds a week that we think the other book that was uh, part of the other. Is there uh, that was very interesting comment you made before, I don't know whether you can expand on that a little bit, even at twenty pounds a week or something like that. Well at twenty pounds a week, um, there would be some individuals, some households, um, who would find themselves with the off means that the benefits and for everybody who remained on the excessive benefit, the overall withdrawal rate that they would experience, it would be lower than before they started to receive the system's income. But so, um, however large the system's income is, um, your ability to earn your way out of poverty would be enhanced. Um, the, the, the system, I mean, the, the math is easy, but yeah. yeah. I want to stop because yeah. we want more speakers to come. Yeah. Um, um, I note that the programme is um, really two and a half hours of continual speaking and no comfort break. <laughs> so after the next two uh, speakers, I can institute a brief um, break so that people can stretch their legs. It's quite uncomfortable sitting still for a long time, uh, so if you're not used to it. So anyway, now I have great pleasure in welcoming as our first main address, which is to be given by Guy, Guy Sandy. Professor at SOAS in the University of London, a trustee of the Citizens Income Trust and a co-chair of BNI, the Basic Income Earns Network. Since his time at the International Labour Organization, Gay has been closely involved with research and debate on citizens' income. More recently, he has been the driving force behind some highly significant citizens' income pilot projects in Namibia and India, and he has written both in Precaria and the Precariat Charter, for which you will find a flyer in your conference pack. Guy was speaking to us about citizens' income, an income score for the Precariat, and the means of global development. Guy, um, you'll be welcome next. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the challenges we all have when we're talking about this subject is always you're talking to some friend who heard you speak about it n times before. So you really should begin with an apology to them for, for saying things that they've heard several times. And it is a, an extraordinary experience because in 1985, a young group of radical philosophers, economists, I'm an economist, sociologists, political scientists, including a certain Annie Miller, we met in Belgium and decided to set up an international network, which we established in 1986, called GAT, Basic Income European Network, to disseminate ideas about basic income. At a time when the neoliberalism was in ascendancy and the whole drift to 
globalization is taking place. And when I was thinking about what to say to you this morning, I recalled that a certain Milton Friedman, in the time he wrote his seminal uh, neoliberal book uh, in 1962, he said that all new ideas take approximately 30 years to go from being regarded as mad and bad and dangerous to being suddenly walked well, again. And the thing I quoted in, in my book, The Precariat, quoted from him, he said, our basic function is to develop alternatives to existing policies to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inept. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't uh, always come to me to agree with Milton Friedman, but uh, <laughs> on this particular one, I'm in full agreement. And we're on course. We're on course. 30 years puts us, we're on course. <laughs> and I can only tell you that having been co-chair and then co-president of the base at the PIAN, which in 2004 at our Barcelona Congress became PIAN, Basic Income Earth Network, because so many people from Latin America and Asia and North America were joining, so we no longer had majority from Europe, let alone Britain. And we're on course because there's a momentum, an energy, internationally, that I promise you is fundamentally much stronger today than it was five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago. And the mention of that basic income initiative, actually we got nearly 400,000 citizens, not 300. And we did it without any money and without any networks in a number of those countries. I was in Bulgaria and my book was translated into Bulgaria and suddenly the trade union leadership decided, yeah, we have to go for a basic income. So I was on the television, the news that evening with the leader of the trade union and within one week we got 40,000 signatures in favor of the basic income without any money, without just networking just come from Croatia, the fantastic energy among the students and activists and, and, and feminists and things, small country, but they can see the logic mm. of it in the context in which they're, they're existing. Now within the background, let me just say that I found the arguments for moving in this direction, and I persisted in calling it basic income, not a citizenship income, or a social dividend, which I've always liked is that we have to see this whole debate as moving with what has been the global transformation. This is the essence of my books, saying, look, this global transformation is about the painful construction of a global market system. And the, all the old forms of welfare and regulation break down in that context. And what we've got is a pursuit of flexible labor markets which means deliberately making labor insecure and unstable. That is fundamental to it. So your old systems of social insurance break down. You just cannot function efficiently or equitably with a social insurance system. Because that's built for an industrial, proletarianized, and proletarianized society. But we've also seen this tremendous drift towards means testing internationally. Tremendous shift, and as I wrote in the 1980s, once you go for flexibility and means testing, you automatically start creating divisions of deserving poor, undeserving poor, and transgressing poor, those who are so called undeserving and then go break the laws for some reason or other. Don't blame them for a minute, and therefore you need to work that because you've got to overcome the fact that there are no incentives to take low pay jobs. You've got poverty traps and you've got precarity traps, which I think are even worse than poverty traps. And I discussed that in the book, so we'll come back to that. Now, the, the, if, you, if you know that you're going towards workfare, and we predicted that in the 1980s, and now you've got it, okay? 
Ian Duncan Smith is only the end game of that whole process. Then you've got to think radically about what the implications are for freedom, what the implications are for distributional outcome, and so on. And that makes you start thinking radically differently about what a basic income or a citizenship income is all about. Now our next point, which I think we have to put into the debate far more, is that the 20th century income distribution system was unique to history. It was the only century in human history where essentially the block of total income was divided between profit and wages. We all know that within the globalization period, the first stage of the global transformation, capital one, profits have gone up. You don't need Pickett's book to tell you that that's the case. I mean, I don't know why so many people are giving you this book hype, because all you've said is what Tony Atkinson and numerous others have been saying for, for many years. We've all been saying it. What is new? But the fact is, that the income inequality, the functional distribution of income has become profoundly unequal with a growing share, not just of profit, that's the easy part of the story, a growing part of total income globally is going to rentier economy, going to rent to intellectual property, those who can monopolize the natural resources, those who can monopolize the technological advances, and it gives the rentier the capacity to take more and more and more of the total pie. And that is the, that is the concept we're facing uh, today. Now, if the rentier system is expanding, and I developed that in the new book, the various ways it's expanding, then you have mechanisms of debt being used as an exploitative system based on putting more and more people into the precariat, more and more people facing a life of chronic uncertainty and chronic insecurity. Right? Those are the realities we're facing at, at this moment. Now, here we have growing inequality. The politicians, with deference to some exceptions, <laughs> ignoring it but making platitudes and things how concerned they are about it, but actually not proposing anything functionally capable of doing a re a readdressing the inequality and the chronic economic insecurity. It's the economic insecurity which is so pernicious, not just the income inequality. So we're back to the situation where we say, what sort of good society do we want? And then we bring it back to saying, well, a good society would mean that everybody Everybody, you, me, everybody, should have basic security. Because without basic security, you can't function as a human being. You can't be rational, you can't plan, you can't be altruistic. But basic security has two key dimensions. And we, promoting basic income, must never, never get trapped in neglecting the second. The first one is basic income security. But the second one is voice, a sense of agency. Because without a sense of associational freedom and the ability to have collective organizations to represent us, we will still remain vulnerable. Those two things must always go together, and that's the essence of this charter that, that, that I put forward. Now, Malcolm has defined basic income, calls it a citizenship income, and I don't see no reason why we can't all live with various names. And I think the individualized nature of it is fundamental, the unconditional, and I won't go into all the other aspects. But I want to use my remaining time to get what are the justifications for moving towards a basic income as your anchor of your social protection system. And I think it's very, very important for all of us to emphasize the social justice, distribution, distributional justice aspect before we talk about anti-poverty. I think this is our really strong calling card. 
Because if you say that this is a matter of justice, that everybody should have a basic income, then you're on the high ground. Challenge me, and I'll ask you. And I think that you can go back to Thomas Paine, you can go back to G.D.H. Cole, and a number of other thinkers in the tradition, and I've tried to spell it out in detail in this new book, in saying, look, the wealth of all of us as individuals is far more due to the efforts of our forebears than anything you or I have done. But you don't know behind the veil of ignorance whether it's your forebears or my forebears or Natalie's who produced the wealth of our society. And in a sense, therefore, we all, as human beings, member of our society, deserve some social dividend as the contribution of the previous generation. And I would ask to present my book to in Middlesbrough. I don't know if we have anybody from Middlesbrough here. And I walked around, and I was taken around Middlesbrough, and I was just because for me, it was the Middlesbrough moment, which I think a politician should use to good effect. Because wherever I was in Leeds recently talking about it, and everybody got it. I went to Middlesbrough, and I was talking and taken around, and Middlesbrough was a tiny hamlet in the 1820s. And suddenly they found iron ore, and it went from being a hamlet to the hub of the British Industrial Empire. And being the hub, you realize that the iron ore and the steel of Middlesbrough was used to construct Sydney Harbour Bridge. It was used to construct the, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And working in India on these pilot places, in Gunstein, the railways was built with the iron ore from Middlesbrough. The wealth of you and me were built in the middle. Go there today, you see, the state boarded up with blocks of concrete and windows. You see weeds going in little parcels of gardens that used to be gardens. And you see flabby people without hope. But the wealth created in the middle has fed and watered the Etonians who are now back in government. The estates in the south of England, who in the smugness of an Ian Duncan Smith with his 1,500 acres of land, he didn't do anything for that subsidy. We need to realize that social justice, that the people of Middlesbrough deserve it just as much as you and I. That is our fundamental starting point. Now, I think you can also argue from a Rawlsian liberal perspective, I call it a, social, a, a security difference principle, that no policy is justifiable unless it improves the security of the most insecure groups in society. Very fundamental. How could you disagree with that? And any other way of attacking social insecurity other than moving towards the basic income, unconditional, actually does not meet that principle. I also add a paternalism test. No policy can be socially just that imposes controls on some groups in society that are not imposed on the most most free groups in society. Why is it I'll do it hmm. I think those two principles are fundamental. But there's a third principle which we should ram down the throats of the utilitarian and neoliberals and old laborers, which is the rights, not charity principle. A policy is socially just only if it advances the rights of the recipient and limits the discretionary power of the bureaucracy. We've gone the opposite direction. The whole opposite direction is scandalous. And why I call it the Charter, and I'm hoping it will resonate next year with the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. If you read the Magna Carta, the most fundamentally <coughs> part of the Magna Carta 
is that which says due process. Due process. No sanctions against anybody without due process. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this government and the last government deliberately eschewed due process. Mm. You can be sanctioned without any due process. I don't like your face. Yeah. I don't like your behavior. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about your behavior, but I don't like it. <laughs> this is the morality, the morality of evil. I'm serious. And we have to be morally indignant about this whole direction. Now I've got three minutes left. I had 20 minutes of stuff, but I'm going to go to it in the three. But I think we have to move into a discussion how are we going to pay? We all know that the debate has thrown at us for 30 years, 28 years, we're still on track. We can do it in a number of ways. My Lord was talking about he hadn't addressed it properly in a TV debate recently because the problem was there's too little time to go into all the possible ways. My only preference is to move towards sovereign wealth funds where you build up a capital fund from rental income. You take part of the rental income, like the Alaska Permanent Fund or the Alberta Fund or the Norwegian Fund, and you use that to build up the capacity for tax. But there are other ways advocated a fracking fund if we were uh, if we <laughs> continue with the disaster of fracking. Uh, but with no, I think another name will have to be found. Uh, <laughs> an alternative, my friend, an alternative complaint to fracking. There are all sorts of devices which are opened up by this debate. It's affordable. I don't buy the argument that it's unaffordable. But I want to end up with by saying not, not only is it affordable, we can argue, we can answer all the standard complaints. And we have done, the literature is, is huge on the subject now. The argument, for example, that it would be inflationary. There's no reason to think that applies because you're replacing other things. You're replacing subsidies that are hugely regressive at the moment. And you could have a system, and I really advocate this in the book, where if you move towards the base income, you would have an independent basic income committee. One minute, oh dear, I've got two, I think. One minute, but, but you could have an independent committee that could actually moderate the level. So they would take it out of politics. You'd have to have some such way of doing it, like the independent uh, monetary committee. The, the, the reducing labor supply argument is one of the most stupid ones. Because it not only would overcome poverty traps and therefore would allow people to take low wage jobs, but there's a lot of psychological research, and our basic income pilots in India have demonstrated this with, with huge amounts of data that we've collected, and the book's about to come out. Actually, a basic income increases work, and it increases productivity. It gives people greater longer term horizons. And then it shifts people away from labor to other forms of work. So it gives people a greater sense of time. I have a number of points, but I'm only going to end up with one point because I haven't made it many times so far. <coughs> the argument in the new book and in this charter is that the basic income is transformative because it is emancipatory. It is a sense in which the emancipatory value of a basic income is greater than the monetary value. I developed that theme at, at length with regards to what's called the Lord of the Day or paradox. But this emancipatory value means that you can actually save money in other respects. And it gives people a sense of control and freedom. And the greatest and most beautiful thing, and I'll end on this if I can get to it without tearing up, is that in the Indian experiment, the most wonderful thing that's happened is a whole lot of the villagers have escaped bondage labor since they got their baby. They pooled their money to buy their freedom. Some of them after 30 years of being in bondage labor. Thank you very much.
Okay, back in a second, guys.